in a minute or so. Uh, and as a note, the meeting is being recorded um, so that you are aware of that. Okay, well, hopefully we've got a good chunk of people who are able to uh, to join and uh, uh, time to, to start off this webinar. So very welcome to everyone who's on this uh, on this call. This is our second Q&A webinar of the, the season and it's uh, the May edition. Um, so this is regarding the infrastructure assessment. So if you're looking for real estate, wrong webinar, um, you should uh, tune in tomorrow, but uh, any infrastructure questions we'll be happy to answer. So a very warm welcome if you are here. Um, so we'll start off the session um, with a quick introduction to the team. As you can see, some of them are, uh, are on the call as well. Uh, we'll talk through the key changes between the 2020 and the 2021 assessments. Uh, and then we'll cover some frequently asked questions. So these are questions that we get asked a lot or that came in beforehand prior to this call. Um, but we'll also have an open Q&A session. So throughout you are able to raise any questions via the Q&A function um, and uh, we will address them throughout. So uh, please do use that. Uh, you've got all of our experts on the line. Um, so really make use of that. Uh, and we'll close off by talking about some of the available resources that we have to help you with your reporting. Um, so as I said, the Q&A function you can see is at the bottom of your screen and please use this one because that means we can sort of track all of the questions in a more straightforward way uh, instead of the chat function. So this is just from our side. And feel free to start asking questions now. We'll probably cover them in a moment. We won't start with them right away, but uh, we'll definitely try to cover as many as we can today. So. Um, very warm welcome from our infrastructure team and we have quite a few of them on the call here today. Uh, so first of all, we have Fabio, who is our intern in the infrastructure team. Uh, and we have Aurelian Reynolds, who is an associate in the infrastructure team. We have David Tassado, who is an, an associate in the infrastructure team. Um, Eric Landry isn't here today, but he is our climate change specialist. Um, besides him, we have Stephen Pringle on the call today, who is our director of member relations and also our EMEA representative. Um, we don't have on the call today, uh, Roxana Isayu, our Chief Sustainability Officer, and Rick Walters, our Chief of Standards and Innovation, um, but they are also part of the infrastructure team. And then lastly, there is me, myself, um, Katie Graneman. I'm an uh, associate on the member relations team, and I represent the infrastructure side on that team. So any questions from any of our members usually come uh, to me now, so we're a new team. For, very exciting. So. Very happy uh, that they're all able to join today. And these are maybe some familiar faces to you already or some familiar names if you've been contacting our help desk or have attended any of our events in the past. So I'm very glad to see you all today. And they'll also be helping with some of the questions that we are getting today. So I'll first talk you through some of those key changes in the 2021 infrastructure assessments. Um, and we'll keep it very high level. So for detailed uh, indicator by indicator overview of the exact changes, please uh, have a look at our reference guides, but um, we're, we're just going to cover the, the key stuff here. Um, so the most important thing is, is that in the asset assessments, the weighting between the two components has changed. So if you remember from last year, um, GREST uses a component structure. So we have a management and a performance component. For the asset assessment in uh, 2020, that was 50-50 between the two components. And this year that has shifted to 4060. So the weighting is 40% for the sorry for the management component and 60% for the performance component. Uh, and this is part of a GRES movement to uh, emphasize scoring of performance and, and is part of a bigger trend that we're um, establishing in GRESP as a whole. Uh, and this is in line with the fund assessment as well as the real estate assessments and has been approved by our governance groups as have all the changes. Now, another key thing is the integration of our resilience module, which was previously optional and uh, an add-on for anyone who was interested in, in uh, participating in that. Uh, it's now been fully integrated into both the fund and asset assessment. 
uh, and it covers uh, questions related to resilience and is aligned with the TCFD. Um, so a really key topic for a lot of investors and a lot of stakeholders, and that's why we felt it was very, uh, a very timely moment to integrate it into the assessments. Uh, and we're, we're working on products relating to uh, resilience as well. Um, so the questions that have been added are mostly in the risk management section. Uh, and uh, some of the questions in leadership have also been altered to include that resilience integration. Uh, any new questions are, are unscored in 2021, so you'll have a year to familiarize yourself with them and to formulate a response and to maybe formulate processes internally. Um, so they might be scored in the future, but they are not scored in 2021. And the leadership questions are scored, but the uh, parts of the questions that relate to resilience are unscored as well. So um, that's part of the usual progress uh, process. Uh, as part of that integration, we've also made some changes to the list of environmental issues, which are obviously a key part of scoring in the management and performance components. Um, so two issues have been removed and a new issue, physical risk, has been added. Now, as to the really exciting part, namely the Q&A. Um, so as I said, please ask any questions through the Q&A function so that we can track them and we can respond to them uh, uh, in a most straightforward way. Uh, you can do this throughout, so start doing that now if you want to, uh, or, or wait a moment as you as we go through some of the pre-prepared questions, uh, and we'll try to cover as many as we can today. So uh, we'll go through some of those pre-prepared questions, and one thing we get a lot is questions about investor access to the results. Um, so is an investor able to access any of my assessment results? Well, Aurelian, what would you say to this uh, this question? Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us on the call. Thank you, Katie. So no, not any investor can access your assessment results, only a Gresb investor members can access your results. Um, there's sort of two way process uh, in order to uh, share your entity results. So the first is sort of top down approach. That means that investor members, uh, once you, your report is available, can request uh, an access to your reports, either the fund report or the asset report. And it is entirely down to the uh, account manager of this entity to uh, accept this request or not. So that's entirely under your control. There's also a bottom-up approach whereby the account manager uh, of an asset or a fund entity um, can proactively look at Gresb investor members and enable access to their report proactively. So that's also another way. Note that for grace period participants, investors will not be able to request access to these entities until the following year or unless grace period is lifted. Yeah, great, thanks Aurelien. Yeah, that's a, that's a really key one uh, to note there. Uh, and sort of relating to that, another question we get a lot is about, okay, so we have access rights for investors, but what does that mean actually for users? Are there different uh, access rights and, and what, what are they? Sure, so we have diff four different types of users on our platforms. Um, from right to left, we've got account managers, investor relations managers, internal contributors, and external contributor. And as you can see on the left-hand side, depending on which user you are, you have more or less rights. The account manager, of course, has the most rights. Uh, it can invite users, it can submit the assessments, um, and typically the account manager is really that centralized person. But note that you can have several account managers on uh, an entity, uh, which means that uh, this allows you to have some flexibility and not necessarily to have to be reliant on one single person to submit the assessment or to even invite other users. So there's a lot of flexibility around this. Note that you can also change the status uh, of the user throughout the reporting period or at any point in time if you're an account manager as well. Uh, the second one we have is investor relations manager. So as you can see, there's a few more rights, but uh, it omits inviting users and submitting assessments. Uh, another popular one is typically internal contributor in the case that entities, for instance, use consultants. And in some cases, uh, they don't necessarily want them to be able to submit the assessment. Uh, the entity only wants uh, consultants to be able to contribute to reporting process. Uh, the user with the le least rights is the external contributor uh, who can simply edit response for you via other users or change entity settings. Great, thanks Aurelian. I'm seeing some questions come in um, and seeing that there is, I think, uh, one more question that we have to be prepared that kind of relates to that. I'm going to take that one first and then we'll go to the questions in the Q&A. 
Um, so that's just one uh, question we get a lot on grace period that kind of relates to that uh, and whether an entity will still be benchmarked if it reports under the grace period, uh, which is the grace period is, of course, only for first year participants and it is an option. So if you do not want to use it, it's also possible. Um, Aurelian, would you be able to explain that? I and mean, will they receive a benchmark report if they if they do? Yes, yeah, so they will receive benchmarking information. So the grace period uh, does not uh, omit you from obtaining benchmarking information. You will be part of the uh, grace period universe and the benchmark. However, uh, you, your report will not be accessible uh, to investors if they uh, request access. But also in the case that you are linked, uh, that your asset is linked to a fund, for instance, uh, the fund will not be able to uh, see uh, your score either, um, unless, of course, there is an account manager or user uh, on the fund for a specific asset account. Great, thanks, Aurelian. And of course, the grace period is such a key one to familiarize yourself with the assessments and to really sort of dip your toe into the water and, and maybe make a few mistakes because it's the first year and you're still getting familiar with things uh, without actually then you know, getting your investors uh, hanging over your shoulder, looking at what you're doing. So uh, it's, a, it's a great way to sort of explore GRESP reporting and to start your GRESP ESG journey. Um, great, I'm seeing some uh, questions come in on the Q&A, fantastic, keep them coming. Um, we'll start with the first one uh, from Natalie. Um, will the resilience module integrate social risk assessment and other questions for resilience that were previously included in the voluntary module? in future years or will it be purely TCFD focused? Um, so David, do you want to get that first question? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so um, essentially the short answer to that one is that um, uh, the social risk uh, or the social part of the, the resilience uh, module was not uh, and will not be part of the uh, resilience indicators that are uh, asked for in the uh, asset and, and fund assessments. Um, this was deemed uh, Un well, unnecessary because we already have several indicators which cover uh, similar topics. Um, and so therefore we just wanted to include the physical and the transition, um, as I say, pillars or aspects of, of TCFD into uh, the main assessments. Yeah, for sure. And, and obviously the TCFD is, is a really key one as that's such an important framework to so many of our stakeholders. So that's a really a priority for us to make sure um, that the work we're doing aligns to that and, uh, and is also beneficial to participants who are already following TCFD guidelines. So it's very much uh, sort of in line with all of that. Um, and we're, as I said, we're working on some products relating to that. So uh, um, Stay tuned and we'll, we'll obviously uh, announce those as soon as we can because it's very exciting work that's happening in that space. Um, great. Cool, and I see some other questions. So I see a question from Ed Walters on Access Rights. Um, any plan to have a read only of the live document? Um, Aurelian, do you wanna answer that one? Sure. So I'm not too sure, uh, Ed, what you mean by live document. I suppose there's, it could, these could be two things. They could either be uh, the survey and the input stages, or they could be the reports that you get um, in October. So um, we don't specifically have plans for the survey to have a read-only uh, version uh, of it. So so that's, that's, that's not something that we've considered, that we've received feedback on. Uh, in relation to the report, uh, the report is typically a read only uh, if you provide access to investors or fund managers. Uh, otherwise, you also have op uh, the option to uh, download a PDF uh, copy of a report, which might be a bit easier to share uh, in a specific case. But you can always share, P you can also share a PDF or print uh, of a response as well of your assessment as well. So uh, if indeed the live um, documents option doesn't really suit you, you can obviously uh, download both of these uh, resources. Okay, great. Um, so Ed has added during completion as it progresses. So Ed, does, does it really uh, answer, answer your question as well? Or do you, uh, do you wanna add anything to that? And feel free to, to just to type that and we, we can pick that up in a moment. Uh, maybe in the interim, we go to Daniel's question, um, who's asked about to what extent are fund generic level policies usable for the assets within the fund? 
I think David wanted to answer that one. So David, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have one uh, Q&A question that's actually very, very similar to this uh, that comes up a little bit later. So I'll use the, the time there to, to, to walk us through um, the, the, the use of policies, not only from the fund manager level to the fund, but also at the, as at the, at the asset level uh, beneath that. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. And then we have one question on ESG issues, which is great. This is actually also one of the, the ones we pre-prepared. Uh, so Arun, do you wanna take that one away? It's from Niam. I hope you say, I say your name correctly, by the way. I'm very bad with, I think it's the Irish name. So apologies if I've mispronounced it. Um, really go sure. ahead. Sure. Um, so shall, shall I just read out the question then, Katie? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, if a materiality assessment outlines that specific ESG issues are not relevant to an entity, but the entity has significant work carried out on those issues, is it possible to amend the assessment in some ways to make them of relevance? So unfortunately, we cannot make any changes to the assessments for this year, um, but we do have a pretty rigorous uh, feedback process in place. So if you we have a specific dedicated resource called the Gresden Materiality and Scoring Tool, and within this document, uh, there's a whole process in order to gather information and feedback uh, in the case that you do disagree with one of your materiality outcomes for a specific issue. Now, once we've gathered this feedback, typically this feedback is collated, uh, and we go for a review of it at the end of the year for next year's assessment. And each of the feedback, it goes under a review of our governance groups. Um, and if indeed uh, your claim and your justification seems relevant, then they'll be under review and with potential uh, for change. Great, and maybe good to add as well is that if you really want to report on something, even if it's not material, you definitely can. It's not uh, impossible to do so. So for example, uh, if air pollution is something that in the materiality assessment comes out as non-material to you, but you think it's a really interesting topic or you're already collecting data on it that you really wanna share with your investors and your stakeholders, you can still report uh, policies, you can report your, uh, your quantitative data and the performance component that's completely uh, possible. So uh, oversharing is always good. So uh, with ESG, communication is the key. Um, Perfect. And then I see we have another question relating to materiality from Estelle. Um, and she asks, hello, if we want to have all the points, do we have to select all the material issues that have medium, high and low relevance? So Aurelian, do you want to answer that one as well? Sure. So the only scored um, issues are those that have a high and medium relevance. So these are the only ones that you typically need to report on. Issues that are of low relevance or no relevance uh, have a zero uh, weighting. So essentially high relevance has a, a weight of two, medium relevance a weight of one, and low and medium uh, typically have no weighting. So you only need to answer uh, the medium and high relevance ones in order to obtain all the necessary points. Perfect. I hope that answers your question, Estelle. Um, and uh, yeah, we were trying to make life sort, sort of straightforward without uh, uh, making it too difficult either. So hopefully uh, that will work out for you well. Um, great, thanks. Good to know us all, thank you. Um, so please do keep sharing Q&A, uh, questions through the Q&A function. We'll be going through some more uh, questions that were asked in advance in the interim, uh, and they might trigger some more questions for you as well. So feel free to jump in at any time and, and just raise those in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to them when we can. Um, so another question we get asked a lot, and that um, maybe relates to, uh, to some of your own situations as well, is about asset grouping. So the question here is, we have multiple locations within the same sector across four different European countries, which we manage as one group. Should we report as one asset for us for independent assets? Um, Aurelia, do you want to answer that question? Uh, I know I'm asking a lot of you. We'll, we'll swap to David in a moment, so uh, he'll get a chance as well. <laughs> no problem, happy to answer this one. Great. Sure, so typically uh, GRESP approach, um, GRESP is a benchmarking tool and hence we see um, at the most granular is where you'll probably obtain uh, the most material information in relation to your benchmarks. So when it comes to reporting across different countries, we typically recommend indeed have one assessment per country. Now in the case, for instance, that you have several assets of the same sectors within the same region, 
we wouldn't necessarily recommend you creating uh, several assessments for visa. One assessment within one specific primary subsector uh, makes sense. So it, it really depends what you want. But of course, if you want to have the most comparable data, uh, it is recommended typically uh, that you uh, go for, for this sort of strategy. And when it comes to sectors, it's a bit of the same thing. Uh, typically, we would recommend that if you have an asset that or, or a company or corporation uh, that, that invest in, in, in diversified asset class, you're probably not going to get a lot of value out of your benchmarking information if you try to cluster uh, many different sectors into one asset assessment. Uh, typically, you'll find yourself in the diversified sector, and although you'll think that you've earned some maybe reporting gains, um, the reality is that your benchmarking information will probably not be granular enough uh, for you to make these meaningful comparisons. So check your primary location, check your primary sector. Uh, obviously, there's certain variation in some cases. Sometimes it is worth uh, engaging with your stakeholders, for instance, your fund managers, uh, in order to you know, best understand what are the needs. And it also depends on what the investable entity is. So there's different dimensions and approaches to this. But yeah, we would recommend in this specific case uh, that you do one asset uh, per country. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're always happy to have this conversation as well. If you're unsure about a specific situation and you just want to run it across our team, you know, we see a lot of different cases. So we're always happy to advise and to sort of give you some recommendations on uh, different approaches. Uh, ultimately, it's up to you, and we have that flexibility exactly because there's so many different kinds of situations. But we're always happy to to have a look at you and to say, like, okay, this is probably what might suit your particular situation. So please don't hesitate to to get in touch with our help desk if you are in a in a situation like that. Um, great. And again, please do keep asking questions on the Q and A function. We will uh, we will address them. Um, in the meantime, we have another question, and these, these ones relate to, uh, to evidence, which is another topic that's always uh, good for a lot of questions on the help desk, uh, and especially one because the G in GRESP obviously stands for global, and we have a lot of assets who operate in environments that are not uh, English speaking. And the question we get asked a lot is, when the evidence is in a different language than English, can it still be used for a GRESP submission? So David, do you want to pick this one up? Yeah. So indeed, a very common uh, occurrence. So the short answer here again is that you can provide uh, the evidence in a, a language other than English, um, but there are a few uh, sort of requirements that, that, that come along with it. So primarily, we look for a, a summary of some sort that supports the checkboxes or the claims which you have uh, ticked or selected uh, in the indicator. Um, the way that this summary can be presented uh, can be done through various through various ways. So first of all, you may choose to uh, next to the the evidence piece uh, in its supporting text box to basically describe it there. Uh, you may also make use of our uh, cover page, which I believe can be found in Appendix 11 of the of the reference of the asset reference guide. Uh, and in this cover page, you can describe, you know, the uh, here there again you can list off a, a summary of of which pieces or which parts of the of the document you've translated are relevant to what you're trying to support uh, or, or lastly you can you know amend within the document itself uh, add some some notes or some text that translate uh, the various areas which which again are relevant so and, and, a, and a tip whenever doing this is to, to continue always in, in the sum in the the summaries and the translations that you're doing to always list off the the page numbers to which you're referring to um, this is always useful for your investors who in, in later on when they're looking at your benchmark reports and looking at the evidence that supports each indicator um, can also themselves in the original document find the evidence um, that, that you're claiming in the original language. Yeah, yeah, and those those evidence cover pages are super, super helpful for our validation team because you can imagine they get a lot of documents across their desks come validation season. So the easier you can make their lives, the happier they will be. Um, so on behalf of them, also really, really helpful to use those. Uh, and it just makes it a lot easier to cross-reference things. I mean, uh, that's an absolute truth. Um, now, speaking of lots of different kinds of documents, another question we do get asked quite often is about using templates. Um, so if the case is that one in this, in this question, um, several of my reporting entities share similar responses, including evidence, is there a quicker way to upload documents for multiple assessments? 
And the short answer is yes, there is. And I'm sure David is again happy to explain that in a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. So a very common case when you have fund managers who are trying to apply uh, a particular, you know, specific management procedures or processes uh, across multiple assets. Um, but obviously there are other scenarios where, where this applies. Um, so what the portal does offer is an ability for you to uh, say you want to apply the same management component across multiple entities, be it fund assessments or asset assessments. You can, once you're in the portal, on the right hand side, click on assessment portal and it'll, um, it'll list off all the entities for which you're uh, able to make changes to and on the different assessments. And on the right hand side of that, you will also see a, a button that leads you to the, to the templating, uh, which is the screenshot that we see here. Um, and from this section, you can effectively open a new template, which will open up a blank assessment. And from this blank assessment, you essentially fill it in just how you would um, across all the assets. So using um, that, that maybe that one policy, which you want to use across the board with the, the supporting text, you then uh, save that template and you can then choose to apply it to whichever entities you see fit. So it's a, it's a time saver for those who, who use it well. Yeah, so an absolute top tip. So uh, make use of that for sure. Um, it's a real lifesaver, especially if you're doing so many assessments, it can get a bit overwhelming, I think. Uh, um, so don't worry, we've got you. There is a, a function for that. Um, so we have another question from Neve. I've been informed that that's how you pronounce your name. So apologies for not getting it right the first time. I'm learning things too in this Q&A. So, but very happy to have you here today. Uh, and Neve has asked if you want to evidence something that there are various versions of, such as a customer satisfaction survey, for example, is it best practice to uh, one, provide the template only or two, provide four to five completed versions or option three, provide all completed versions? Uh, so really, do you wanna pick this one up? Sure, I would like to nearly introduce a, an option four if possible. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's essentially uh, each, each indicator that requires evidence uh, abides by certain requirements in relation to this evidence. So in some cases, uh, one, one document may be enough if it abides by all of the requirements. But in some cases, uh, one document isn't enough and it could be scattered across several documents. So in this practical example, uh, I would do an, a 2.A. So <laughs> uh, instead of providing four to five completed versions, if, if one of the versions of the customer satisfaction surveys already abides by uh, necessary requirements, then there's no need to uh, upload more than more than one. Uh, we're only looking for a customer satisfaction survey that abides by a the right reporting period, whether the necessary elements can be found that relates to the entity. Uh, that would be perfectly sufficient. Um, so yeah, so so make sure that this abides by this. In in some cases, especially when it comes to for instance risk assessments, it could be that you have different risk assessments per issue. So indeed, in this case, uh, it could be that you have to upload. Uh, several risk assessments in order to buy uh, buy this it, it all it all really depends but typically uh, check the evidence requirements and then make sure that these documents uh, you know abide by these requirements uh, more is not necessarily better but um, yeah this this is my answer to this one thanks option 2a i like it um hopefully that answers your question eve um, I see there's a question on certifications. I'm going to park that for a moment because we have something on certifications in a bit. So I think that's a great moment to address it then as we also address another uh, question that came across our desk before. And I want to pick up one more pre-asked question on legal docs and how we can use those for evidence. So um, this is the case in many jurisdictions, especially in developed countries that certain ESG, ESG issues are already covered by law. Uh, so in this case, child labor might already be something that companies need to not do um, as a legal requirement. Um, so how should an entity uh, in such a situation report this under the risk management and uh, policies indicators? What will your answer be there, uh, David? Yeah, so indeed also another very common occurrence, particularly in the, in the developed markets. Um, if we take the example of child labor, that, that does tend to be something that often comes up. So the validators, um, you know, effectively are and have given the benefit of the doubt in the past if an entity simply refers 
to the fact that their asset abides by a particular um, local regulation, um, which is applicable to one of the issues um, in the checkboxes. Um, however, you know, we do strongly advise that in order to not have it come down to a, a benefit of the doubt type of situation or um, you know, as, as well in the future, as we as we move to to you know stricter um, and more comprehensive validation, we do look look or would, would would advise that you provide some information on the actual process and the implementation, um, uh, you know, of uh, that that's being put into place in order to uh, abide by said. Um, you know, law or regulation. So to at least show a minimum of, of you know, what policies and, and what internal procedures have been put in place in order to, to stay on, on the right side of that, of that regulation. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of the answer on that one. Um, try to show a minimum, don't leave it to, to chance. And it's also just good practice uh, to do so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I think we can all agree on that. Um, and and again, it ties into making as, as abundantly clear to the validators as possible what's going on, where you're actually doing, and and how you've how you've dealt with certain things, and, and making it very clear to the answers that you're giving in the assessment match up with your evidence. That's like the real key thing that they're looking for, for throughout the validation process. So um, just uh, good to bear that in mind at all times. And now we have obviously the question that was asked by Daniel um, beforehand in a way as well um, about whether evidence can be at a different level can be applied for multiple assessments. Um, so David, do you want to continue with that one? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the first part, when, um, when you ha have a fund manager who has a policy, for example, that needs to be applied uh, to the fund entity, the validators um, look for any sort of evidence or, 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 or notes or mention of, of an existing link. So in short, the answer is yes, you can submit evidence from the fund manager that applies uh, to the fund assessment or uh, in turn the, the asset uh, assessment, so long as you show the clear links um, between, between you know, the fund manager, the fund and, and, and the assets underneath it. Um, this is simply because, you know, in some cases in the past, we, we have seen evidence rejected, uh, you know, whereby in situations where the fund manager name has nothing to do with the, the, the fund or, or the, the, the entity, the asset entity that is reporting, the validators have, have gone online, couldn't find any information uh, specifically on that either. And then they, so therefore they couldn't confirm that link. So it's just always good practice, either in your cover letter or in the evidence itself, just to add some some notes that describe um, this the linkages between uh, the entities, if it's not clear already um, from from uh, the the entity name uh, that's been given, the legal entity names that have been given. So, yeah. Again, yeah, it's uh, it's all about making it clear, clear, clear. Using that evidence cover letter to the to the best of its ability. So it's really um, evident where where the where the information can be found and, and what it applies to. Um, so maybe this is a great moment to uh, to to touch on the question on certifications. And like I said, we had a pre prepared one, so that ties in I think quite nicely uh, with that one. So let me see if I can uh, pull that one up. So you should be able to see that. Yes, perfectly. Um, so um, the the original question that we we were asked prior to this session uh, was on the applicability of of certifications and management system. So uh, the question was, why doesn't GRESP accept ISO as an ESG certification under CA1, uh, which is the certifications indicator in the performance component, uh, which ties in with a question we were also just asked in the Q&A um, uh, function um, by an anonymous attendee, um, which is certifications is reserved for certifications of the built infrastructure, uh, which is unfair for companies. Um, so I won't read out the whole question because I think we'll first address the first bit and then we can maybe talk about the second bit. Is that all right, David? Yeah, so addressing the first question on ISOs and ESG certification. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll go and we'll pick up the rest of that question by the uh, anonymous attendee. Yeah, so uh, in a nutshell, it's got to do with so why we don't accept 
ISOs in the indicator CA1, so that's called CWIS certifications, uh, is down to a few reasons. Uh, first of all, Gres wanted to create, you know, so we, there's also another indicator, um, uh, risk management number one, so RM1, whereby we specifically ask for management uh, systems, uh, and that is that is where we recognize uh, operations and, and procedures that are undertaken by the company um, at a management system level, which includes um, all the different ISOs. And so in CA1, we're looking for something uh, different in order to not, to not double count. Um, we're looking specifically for technical um, sort of, how should we put this? Technical specifications that apply at the building or facility level of uh, an infrastructure asset that have been certified uh, to, a, to a particular standard so some of the examples that you might have heard of is, is uh, certifications such as LEED or, or BRIAM, uh, whereby you know retrofittings or the way the building has actually been physically built um, is up to a particular standard that allows for less energy consumption or um, better you know performance in, with regards to waste or, or water management of the of the building itself, um, and how that ties into the the question that's come in. Um, regarding the uh, the use of uh, well, why Gres doesn't accept um, facilities that have been uh, certified for, for example, in this case, the, the feedstock um, of of the facility and uh, certifications of where that feedstock uh, comes from and, and 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 it's the final product that comes out of it. Um, so essentially, this. This question has a few layers to it as well. So the reason why Gres currently uh, has not yet um, allowed for these kind of certifications to be accepted um, is is down to in part well it never it was never requested by um, the, the stakeholders up until this point to have certifications that are uh, specific to the operations um, and the the let's say the the output of a, of a facility um, and. Additionally, and, and, and to that, we haven't also attributed a high weight uh, to this indicator. Um, so it, whether in the future we will start to accept uh, such certifications comes down to how the industry wants us to move forward with this. I think it's just been difficult to uh, set up um, a, a solid, how should we say, a, um, a solid methodology for, for approving these types of certifications simply because if you take this example uh, here, um, you could have a very small portion of the of the output that's actually certified from the facility, um, and so we would need to sort of set a, a threshold and, and with the industry decide what the threshold would be um, in order for, for for sufficient output from the facility to be considered, uh, you know, um, uh, Im impactful. Um, and, and so I think that's where the the, the difficulty lies, but. For sure, I mean, I can clearly see why something like this in, in the future, you know, might have its place. Certainly, um, for entities that you know, infrastructure is indeed it's, it's a very diverse asset class, um, and and we are not the same as as real estate, and we need to adapt to that. Um, and perhaps in future years, you know, this will, this could be something that we will bring up to our advisory groups um, and see what they think of it and start a discussion. Uh, regarding um, regarding this, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's really nice to have a dialogue like this because this is very, you know, uh, the assessments aren't set in stone that we change them year and year for good reasons because they adapt to changing circumstances. So your feedback is very much welcomed, and it's definitely the kind of thing we take on board as we uh, look towards twenty twenty two and beyond and develop the assessments further. As I said. At the start, we're increasingly paying attention to scoring performance and to measuring performance in a meaningful way. Um, so I think that ties in very nicely with that progress that we're making, uh, doesn't it, David? Yeah, and I mean, of course, you also, it's, it's a very valid point that you know. And, and again, with the diversity of infra, of course, some some uh, assets are not you know heavily uh, built or driven by the physical built infrastructure that's there, or it might be very small. So we you know. We, we recognize that it's something that uh, needs to be considered. Yeah. Oh. 
apologies. I was trying to find the, the right slide and I accidentally clicked the wrong one. Um, so thank you. I think that's kind of covers that question. So if you have any more Q&A questions, please put them in and we, we have enough time to address them, I think. So uh, in the interim, we'll, we'll go to some of those other um, ones that came in beforehand. So I'll, I'll go to the proper slide again. There we are. Um, and this is a question uh, on COVID. Um, and so obviously last year, uh, if you were reporting to GRESB last year, you might remember we had an extension of the deadlines um, of the reporting season. So uh, the final deadline was a month later and uh, everything else moved up accordingly as well. Uh, and that was very obviously for reasons that are super, uh, super applicable to so many of our participants about furloughed employees, general state of chaos that the world was in uh, last year. Um, this year, we are not extending the deadline um, and the performance scoring, well, I think, think it will be all right, but um, I think Aurelian will be able to answer that with a bit more detail. Sure, I'm happy to. Yeah. So first, I'd like to make clear that reporting uh, on performance in the Grez Infrastructure Asset Assessment is primarily based on the uh, ability to report as opposed to actually scoring performance. So it's really about transparency and having these metrics uh, available. Uh, this is the primary way we're currently uh, scoring this. So obviously in the future, uh, we do have plans to maybe score performance and the exact data that has been inputted for each of these metrics. But right now we're really looking as to your ability uh, to report on these uh, metrics. So what we do do and what we have done in the past is typically check for certain outliers uh, in order to uh, make sure that there's correct data quality um, and so obviously um, we used to make certain outreaches so we will bear this in mind uh, when we do conduct this analysis and we will conduct uh, outreaches so um, if for any reason for instance uh, COVID-19 uh, has impacted the way you report in any different way please feel free to use the invested context box uh, the more we know and the better we understand uh, these fluctuations and more can also help us inform our assessment especially when we'll try uh, to address performance scoring so as long as you provide context explain uh, what were the issues with the data especially if you're seeing a lot of fluctuations compared to uh, your previous year reporting data uh, please do provide your explanations uh, in there yeah thanks Aurelian and it's also good to note that those boxes uh, those text boxes will be printed on your benchmark report so anyone reading your results or reviewing your report uh, in the fall will be able to immediately see like, hey, this data looks weird. Oh, and then there's a little explanation. Oh, it's due to, you know, maybe there is a lower occupancy of the space and therefore the consumption data is looking a little different uh, than last year or the other way around, who knows? Um, so that's a really helpful thing to, to bear in mind. And obviously you don't have to use it just for COVID. If there's other things going on with your data, you can always use that one. Thanks, Raylene. Um, so let's see if there are any other Q and A's come in. Great. Um, there's another question we get, uh, we got on evidence. Um, so an anonymous attendee has asked, is there a specific way that you have to evidence that a document was created slash in use during the assessment period? I.e. if we provide proof of policies, how should we prove that they were created during 2020? Um, and, and David, I think this is a question that you, uh, you can answer for sure. Yeah. So. Uh, essentially, any policy uh, that, that you have uh, put together and, and we're making use of, um, normally we look for it to have been at least dated. So um, I'm, I'm not sure in your particular scenario, maybe if you, if you wrote the policy pre-2020, you can um, provide documentation that, that shows um, in the policy with, with, a, with a date of, of when it was last reviewed or, um, or, or, or when it was created. Um, if you if you had a policy that was created in 2020, it's also acceptable, um, so long as you show that it, you know if, if there's a month that can show that it was uh, applicable for the majority of the year, um, then we would need that. But unfortunately, if yeah, it, we I mean, needed a minimum information on 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 a, when it was last reviewed or when the policy was first created, um, and then we look to see uh, the validators will look to see if that policy would have been in, th in, in theory based on the on the month that you've given um, in place for the majority of the reporting year that you that you state uh, at the start of the assessment. Great, I hope that answers the question. 
Uh, and we have another question from Natalie, uh, who's asked, when might you include data assurance as a scored element of the performance section and more rigor in data requirements? Well, Natalie, I think that's a question I think everyone's eager to answer. We're going to see both David and, and really an unmuting themselves. So you guys decide who goes first. <laughs> Oh, um, sure, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. So, so yeah. uh, a really great question, and and something that um, I, I certainly am. I'm definitely pr a pro uh, pro for uh, getting more data assurance. However, it it does come with its with its caveats. So um, uh, we have had some pushback from from our advisory groups on this matter. So in terms of getting data assurance to become either mandatory or scored in any manner. Um, and the, the pushback comes from the fact that uh, there's there are sort of concerns that because it is it can be quite an expensive and time uh, time you know heavy um, process um, in terms of resources it takes up quite a bit the the larger uh, managers with more resources and larger assets with more resources would be able to to undertake this uh, this more often. Um, whereas the small entities wouldn't be able to. So uh, the, in, in short, again, the idea is that we, we would like to move towards this and of course, increase, increase, improving our, our data quality uh, you know, over time will, will be based heavily on, on our ability to move towards uh, better data assurance, uh, more consistent data assurance from our, from our entities. But at the moment, there is a little bit of pushback. So um, we we can probably say that yes we'd like to move toward this in the future but i can't really say when yet uh, really did you want to add anything on top of that um no i think my only comment is that uh, we're, we're also seeing with the various uh, regulatory initiatives uh, at least from the eu that uh, there's quite a lot of interest in regards to data quality and there has been some talks about uh limited assurance uh, specifically uh for the csrd so um yeah, it's, it's definitely in talks with regulations. So, um, yeah, more to come, I guess. Uh, it could be that in the future, even regulations imposes uh, certain data quality um, abidance. So, so, so we'll see. Yeah, only the future knows at this point in time. Clearly, uh, additional comment. <laughs> it clearly highlights the dichotomy between the regulation and, and the wishes of, of some of the larger or some of the participants. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you for that question, uh, Natalie, because it's something that's very much top of mind, as you can tell. Um, and, and so maybe nice, nice sort of tie in is actually on, on some of that performance data and what is actually currently mandatory in the assessments. Um, so you, if you've looked at the performance component, you might have seen some of these tables and wondered what the different colors are all mean. Um, there is a logic to them. Um, and the question we get a lot is, should I complete everything? Is, is everything required? And, and what am I actually scored on? So uh, David, can you actually run us through that uh, very quickly so that everyone uh, has, a, has a quick reminder of what that actually means? This one's for you, David. <laughs> I think David, uh, are you still able to hear us? Uh, I'm back. Okay, <laughs> for a moment there, I was very worried. Um, we would have to come up with the answers ourselves, but um, are you able to take uh, to answer and explain the, the sort of performance tables that we're seeing? I'm happy. I'm happy to have, take over. Yeah. <laughs> you might have some connection issues with David, so really, and go ahead uh, and, and please run us through it. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Um, Sure. So, so essentially, uh, there's a distinction between all the different shadings, as SK just mentioned. And uh, as you can see in the example, on, I believe, uh, is that the dark outline means that these metrics are mandatory to report on. So that means that uh, if you select yes to respond uh, on a specific indicator, you will have to fill in all these mandatory ones. So by way of example, uh, we've got the metrics groundwater, seawater, brackish water, surface water, third party reuse, third party treatment. These are mandatory to report on for the reporting year performance of 2020. Now, the gray outline means to have the optional, you don't have to fill them in, they're not scored, doesn't matter. The light green or orange shading means it's scored. So in this specific case, total discharges to sensitive waterways is the scored metric. Now you will see that uh, for the 
reporting your target and for future year target, these are also scores. So make sure that you fill in this specific row um, in order to get the necessary points. Um, finally, we've got sales with prefilled number values or NA, uh, which means that these are typically calculated automatically. So in some cases, and I think that's very much the way the, the case for some metrics, you have to fill in the mandatory uh, metrics first, and these will then uh, automatically be calculated, but only for reporting year performance. That's also something quite important to remember. Uh, reporting year target and future year target, there's, there's no calculation uh, in the scored sales. Okay, so you just need to put in uh, the absolute number uh, for the reporting year or future year target. And you do not need to report on the mandatory metrics for reporting year or future year target. Typically, just report uh, on the ones uh, that are shaded. So hopefully that's clear. Um, I'm just also going to come back to this distinction between light green or orange shading. So in some cases, depending on your sector allocation, uh, there could be uh, different scored metrics and that's particularly uh, found for instance under energy uh, for in the case that your uh, power generator versus a typical asset that simply consumes uh, energy for example so watch out for these and uh, yeah <laughs> hopefully that, that provides a clear explanation of how these different shading and colors work Thanks, Irene. I think we've got David back as well, but I think you've handled that well. So maybe, you know, we should just make you answer all of these questions next time. I think it's, it's totally fine. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's always good to, to sort of have a look in the reference guide if you forget, because um, we, I think, explain everything in there as well. So you can look up every metric and double check whether the, they're mandatory for you, whether you, uh, you can skip them if you're not uh, collecting data on them. Uh, so that's just good to bear in mind. Uh, we're kind of nearing the tail end of the of the session. So if you have any last questions that you want to ask, now is your chance. So please go ahead and do it. Um, I see we just got a question from Daniel again. Uh, and Daniel has asked, um, if an asset is sold during the reporting year, can policies of the previous owner be used as they were still in place and used by the asset? Uh, so David, let's see if we can get you uh, get you talking again. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, in, in, in this particular case, um, you can uh, make use of, of the policies that were used uh, previously. If you can show that they were in place, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. It's actually usually the, the, the opposite that turns out to be problematic. It's, it's previous owners who do not want to share information um, when, 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 you know, when you purchase, purchase the asset. Uh, the previous owners don't want to share the information and uh, you can have troubles with meeting you know uh, having enough information that covers a significant portion of the reporting year um so in this particular case it's, it's perfectly okay to do so to make use of policies from the pro previous owner that apply to the asset yeah, yeah because ultimately again, yeah sorry david go ahead uh, sorry uh, and again just as we've mentioned several times just make sure to, to, to make this clear to the validators uh, because they will see an entity they might see a, a different name uh, on the on the top of, at the top of the policy document, um, and so just make sure that, that they understand this link and, ex and explain it. Um, but otherwise, it should be fine. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah, that's a, that's a really good one to add. Because if that's if it says a different different company name, it might get a little bit confusing otherwise. So that's a good one to bear in mind. Um, great. And we have another question from Estelle who asks uh, just to know if the law of our country can be part of the proof just like in the additional context. So, uh, so am I correct in understanding uh, they are asking whether you should include maybe an excerpt from the, from the law uh, itself that you're referring to in the ESG issues for, uh, for your evidence, is that correct? Uh, feel, free to, feel free to send that in, in either chat or the Q&A and maybe um, based on that assumption, David, do you wanna start picking that up? Yes, the SL's confirmed. Yeah, you. Um, so, Indeed, you, it, it can be used as part of the proof. Um, it certainly helps the, in this case of bad data because, um, it, as I mentioned earlier, it will more typically be the case that um, you may not have a, a full-fledged uh, policy, for example, that, that supports uh, the law that, that you're uh, abiding to. Um, and so you may have instead just a summary of, of the procedures that you use to abide by it uh, rather than official documentation so if you can support 
those summaries with here's here's the the law that uh, you know the regulation that, that we're trying to stay in line with using this 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 summary of the process then it, it helps the validators for sure um yeah. great hopefully it was helpful as well um and then we have another question on evidence um and this one from an anonymous attendee uh would documents dated December 2020 be accepted as evidence for a January to December 2020 reporting year? Um, now, David, do you also want to answer that one? I think you kind of explained some of that already before, so that might be a, a good tie-in. Yeah, uh, so uh, it, it would be um, in, in most scenarios. So if we take, uh, for example, uh, the reporting one indicator, so where we ask, so, do you have any integrated reports or sustainability reports that were published uh, uh, this year? If you publish your sustainability report um, at the end of December for, for that year, then, that, then that's that's totally fine. Um, where you might start to have more, you know, where, where, where it's not as, uh, where it might start to cause issues uh, to provide documents that are right at the end of the year is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, with policies. So if you if you wrote up a policy document um, in, in November or December and you published it then and you use that uh, as your evidence, uh, it wouldn't be accepted because it's clearly not been applicable throughout the majority of the year. Um, but again, when it comes to other types of information, whether you carried out a customer uh, satisfaction survey, employee satisfaction survey, if those are docu if those are dated for 2020, you know, it's just a one point in time you, you carried out this action in the reporting year, then it's, it's fine. So it, it does depend, but generally, I mean, when I think in, in my mind of, you know, I've got a little summary of all the indicators in my head. Uh, yeah, generally it is, but it is sensitive in some situations such as the policy indicators. Thanks, David. That was, I think, very, very helpful. Um, we're kind of nearing the end of the session. So what I would like to do is I'll take you through uh, some of our resources. If you still have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask them to us, but we might not address them during this session, but get back to you afterwards. Um, so I'll take you through the resources very quickly, conscious of time. Um, so the main one that you want to be looking at if you're doing GRIS reporting is the resources page. And we have a lot of documents on our website. It's a treasure trove of information. So we have our reference guides online. We have the scoring documents that detail exactly how each indicator is scored, uh, including indicator summaries. We have the assessments in Excel format, noting that those cannot be uploaded in the portal. So they're strictly for your internal use to um, sort of prepare for your GRES reporting. We have a sector location matrix, which will help you understand what peer group you're likely to fall in. Uh, the materiality and scoring tool, which is so key, as already already mentioned, in understanding your materiality and also uh, very helpful for us if you want to use that to provide feedback on whether you think a certain relevance is maybe not applicable to your specific situation. Um, and then we have a new document on scope three guidance. Um, so that's for your greenhouse gas emissions. So if you're reporting scope three or if you're thinking of reporting scope three, you might want to check that one out. Uh, it provides some recommendations on how to tackle that. Now, another super helpful resource uh, I find is the, is the training platform. So um, this has been available since last year. We've updated it this year with, uh, with some of our videos. Um, so it's incredibly, it's, it's incredibly detailed and it's free to, to enroll. So you can explore as much as you want uh, without any additional cost. Uh, and you're able to watch any kind of videos. And there are a few helpful ones also on tips and tricks for reporting that you might want to check out and uh, uh, very useful ones uh, for, for that reason alone. So do you have a, a little go at that? Um, then I would like to draw your attention to the fact that it's very close to the deadline for requesting a response check. So if you are considering uh, requesting one, uh, you should really get in touch as soon as possible so we can book it in. Um, the deadline is the 1st of June. Uh, and you can, re can request those response checks directly uh, through the assessment portal. So if you go to your assessment, you go to the little shop button as indicated in the screenshot, uh, and uh, it's quite self-explanatory. If you're not sure um, whether you need a response check or if you have some questions about the process, feel free to get in touch with us. Which brings us to my last slide on our help desk. We have a really uh, amazing help desk team who uh, has, has the aim to respond for any question within two business days. 
Uh, you can contact us through the forum. There's lots of buttons in the portal as well if you're navigating your assessment. Uh, and you'll probably get uh, one of the Fabio's men who've just uh, been explaining things, uh, as well as Fabio, who's not explained things, but knows a lot as well, um, uh, on the other end, helping you with your question. And we always try to make sure that we, we get back to you as soon as possible. And if we don't know, then you've asked a very difficult question. So uh, also really well done if you've done so, <laughs> and it will help us as well. So uh, last reminder, the deadlines, response check 1st of June, submission deadline 1st of July, uh, midnight Pacific Standard Time. Um, so thank you very much for attending this webinar today. I thought it was very interesting. I've learned more things, so that's great. Uh, uh, and I hope you have as well. And, and feel free to, to get in touch with any feedback if you have additional questions, anything. As I said, we have an open help desk and uh, we're always looking forward to hearing from you. So have a really nice rest of your day and thanks again for participating. Thanks everyone.